Hi, this is Len Edgerly, and this is the Kindle Chronicles podcast on Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 from Ocean Park, Maine. I usually upload my podcast on Fridays, but Dean Kuntz's publicist at Amazon Publishing requested that I release this episode today, which is publication date for Dean's latest novel, The Big Dark Sky. I spoke with the author yesterday afternoon, reaching him at his home in Southern California. His new book, released by APUB's Thomas and Mercer imprint, is the last of five standalone novels Dean has published with Amazon under a deal signed two years ago this month. The first was Devoted, released in March of 2020, followed by Elsewhere in October 2020, then The Other Emily in March of 2021, and Quicksilver in January of this year. At age 77, Dean Kuntz has sold more than 500 million books worldwide in his career. A survey by Codex reported on in the Wall Street Journal in 2020 put him at number five in the number of millions in the top authors buying fan base, buyer fan base, they call it. These are kind of the, the steady buyers of their books. Uh, As you might guess, Stephen King leads that list with a fan base of 10.6 million buyers, followed by James Patterson, 7.3 million, John Grisham at 6.9 million, Tom Clancy, 4.9. The survey reported 4.4 million buyers in Dean's fan base, ahead of Nora Roberts, Dan Brown, Lee Child, and others. That number, I don't think, reflects whatever addition to Dean's fan base have resulted from his deal with Amazon Publishing. Uh, In a prior interview in which I asked a question about his earnings from his books, he said something to the effect of, if I was doing this for money, I would have stopped long ago. Why then does he continue to publish novels at such a brisk pace? As you'll hear in the interview, the answer includes the reinvigoration of his creativity sparked by the change-embracing team at Amazon, as well as his own delight in solving literary challenges of increasing degree of difficulty. I want to thank Beth Parker for setting up the interview and accommodating a schedule change that I requested in order to visit my college buddy Ben Beach in Madison, Connecticut last week. Here is my conversation with Dean Kuntz, recorded yesterday, July 18th, 2022, by Zoom. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm on the coast of Maine on a Kind of a foggy day. You're in Southern California? Yeah, I, it was foggy this morning, but uh, I think it's going to get pretty hot now. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it looks like a, a new set of bookshelves you've got behind you this relatively is, recently. This is Linda's office. And uh, uh, I think we, yeah, we've done out of here before, but I don't know if we had video. Yeah, yeah, I think we were doing by phone. Well, good. I uh, enjoyed reading The Big Dark Sky. I look forward to talking about it. Do you have a hard stop uh, uh, at the hour, or how much time do you have? Whatever you want. Half an hour is good for me, so yeah. maybe go till about 10 past the hour. Okay. And it will, I'll just have audio for the podcast, although you look perfectly uh, presentable for video. <laughs> if I were doing a video podcast, you're not in your pajamas. <laughs> That's uh, No, I uh, <laughs> I gave that up some a couple of years ago, spending <laughs> the day in my pajamas. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, you can. <laughs> um, well, uh, I have a, a grandson visiting from Massachusetts who's eight years old, and I told him, you know, I'm going to talk to this author about a book he just wrote that I read. And, and he said, well, I have a question you should ask him. I said, well, okay, what's the question, Jake? And he said, you should ask him what inspired you to write this book. And that's uh, a, a not infrequent question to ask an author, but in homage to uh, uh, my grandson's love of books, I thought I'd, I'd let him have the first question and ask you what inspired you to write this one. That's pretty professional for an eight-year-old. Um, that's right. So I think I see he may have a certain destiny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the, the subject of synchronicity uh, really extravagant coincidences uh, that C. G. Uh, Jung, Jung uh, said proves there, are, there, there is a connection among, uh, he thought it was a connection among all human minds to shape essentially the future. Now, I don't know if that's correct, but what it, but it ties very 
immediately into what we know about quantum mechanics, that the world is intricately an intricate web of cause and effect, and sometimes the effect comes before the cause, uh, which is a very strange concept to get your head around. But uh, but I've been collecting synchronicities, uh, real synchronicities, for about 40 years. And 40 years ago, when I got really interested in that thought, there's a novel in this, but all, over all these decades, it always defeated me because what I was concerned about was you don't want to create a novel where all this web of very subtle coincidences leads to bigger and bigger things. Uh, and then have the reader say, oh, it's just all based on coincidence, which it isn't. That's not the point. The point is these coincidences are something more than that, which is what uh, uh, synchronicity says about itself and what quantum mechanics says uh, about the world. Uh, so it took me about 40 years, and then I was... An idea came into my head about a woman who would have a secret friend or something like a secret friend in childhood that she bonded with. And now it's 20 some years later, um, 25 years later, and she has totally forgotten about that secret friend. But somebody maybe pretending to be that secret friend uh, calls her and says, Jojo, I'm in a dark place. You have to come back. Um, and these two, it was after that one, and I couldn't think what to do with that story. And one day, well, everything started to click, and I realized it was a story about synchronicity. So sometimes in this rag and bone shop of my brain, all this stuff that's lying about kind of crawls together and fuses into something. And uh, that was, it's uh, an interest of 40 years duration combined with a later interest in quantum mechanics and another story idea altogether. And uh, sometimes you don't know where they come from, but in this case, I can kind of see this one, how it crawled together in my brain. So in the synchronicity department, there's one that is very eerie that you mentioned about uh, a cabin boy who is uh, in a shipwreck, and then it turns out it becomes Richard Parker, who's the name of my niece's cat. There's a synchronicity for you. But uh, do some of these in the past 40 years where you were considering this topic, have they come in your own life that you've seen things align in very unusual ways that have given you the same sense that uh, the shape of your life is sometimes uh, anticipating the actual synchronicities? Uh, I have been alert to very strange things in life for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm going to write about it a couple of days uh, in nonfiction terms. Uh, and uh, some, uh, I won't go into what this was, but a very weird thing happened uh, to me. And it, it happened in the middle of the night. And I thought, what is this I'm seeing? And uh, we were lying in bed in a dark bedroom. And I, I had been seeing something very odd for a while. I won't go into it. It's a too long a story. But on this one occasion, there was this thing in a very dark bedroom. Something that had a light of its own seemed to be floating across the bed. And I've been watching it for some time, circle around the room. Uh, and at one point, it crossed the bed. And I reached up for it. Now, remember, it's a dark bedroom. Uh, and I reached up. And as I reached up, my wife beside me said, you won't be able to touch it. And the chill ran up my back. This thing I had been seeing, she saw as well. Uh, more, there's much more to that story, which I'll tell someday. Even the fact of how my wife and I met, now we've been married almost 56 years, uh, was involved so many small coincidences that uh, you say, oh, it was a chain of coincidences. But... Uh, I had a friend who had a car. His father was a banker, our town banker in our town. Uh, uh, they had two cars. We only had one sort of broken down car that my father used. But I used to go out cruising with Larry, my friend. And I was a uh, senior in high school, and uh, uh, I had never seen this woman who was standing on the street corner. It was my future wife. We pulled up at the stop sign. There's this chain of coincidences of why we were out that day. Uh, and I won't go into all that, but we pulled up at the stop sign. And I looked and I said, 
oh my, who is that? And he said, oh, you want nothing to do with her. And I said, why not? And he said, her father's the town shoemaker. <laughs> this was a class. I town. see. Yeah, and, you can do better uh, than that. <laughs> and I said, well, remember, my father's the town drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a big step up to the epidemic. <laughs> and the story of how we eventually came together had so many coincidences in it. And uh, I, I look back on it and think, if we hadn't been in that place at that moment when she was crossing the street, everything would have been different. And when you think of all the f- sort of things that happened earlier in the day that led us to be there, you, it, it gets kind of eerie. And... Uh, and the Richard Parker you mentioned, for anybody who doesn't know, Poe wrote a story about uh, uh, people stranded on a ship. I'll condense this. And they end up having uh, to uh, survive. He, uh, I think it was a cabin boy named Richard Parker. Uh, years go by. This is a famous story in its time. And one day, these events actually occurred on a ship at sea. And the ship's cabin boy, who ended up being cannibalized, name was Richard Parker. And the coincidences between that story and the real world event are so eerie that it kind of takes your breath away. There are several uh, synchronicities mentioned in the book that are real world. The one that takes me not to dwell on this, but it is what the book's about, uh, was uh, Beatrice, Nebraska, in 1950 at the Westside Baptist Church. Every Sunday night, they had choir practice. And it was 15 members of the choir. No one in years had ever been late uh, because the choir master was very demanding. And on this particular Sunday, every one of the 15 was late for a different reason. One was in a car accident. One had a family member get suddenly ill. 15 different reasons. 15 people didn't show up. They usually all showed up early. One person got there almost on time. And was pulling up in front of the church to park when the church blew up from a gas explosion. And everybody in the church would have been killed if they had all been there because the church completely burst into flame and collapsed. Now that's a synchronicity that makes you stop and think about what is the world's true structure that we are only beginning to understand through quantum mechanics. Well, there's a little chill going up my spine because 1950 is the year I was born. Uh, I didn't know that that was happening in Beatrice. <laughs> Let's talk a little about Joanna Chase, who you referred to as we got into it, who was known as Jojo as a, as a child. Uh, she's a novelist uh, like you, and I was curious about... Uh, she's 34 in the story, and... If you think back to where you were as a novelist in your early 30s, she's published or written six novels uh, filled with yearning for transcendence. I, I, I thought that might be a, a way to think of what you were filled with in your 30s. But did you consciously uh, model her on your own memories of you as a novelist at that age? Or are there areas that, that she's just very different from how you what you recall of yourself? Well, I, I would think that part of she's yearning to write something more meaning, <clears throat> of true meaning, and certainly that's where I was at that time. The, the thing I envy about her is she's somewhat more successful at 34 than I was. It took me a while longer than that, not too much, a few more years, and then it started to gel. Uh, but, yeah, there's those little uh, little things, I think, also, uh, she grew up in Montana and eventually and until she was nine, and then uh, it was transitioned into uh, New Mexico. And I, there was a little bit of that being displaced in her life as I moved west to California at a much uh, later point in my life. Uh, actually, I would have been... It might have been around when I was in my early 30s. Uh, so probably I was playing a little bit with that about somebody who comes from two different cultures, two different American cultures, and uh, has forsaken one of them for the other. Hmm. Uh, 
one thing you say about her in describing her is that she uses self-reflection as a tool in creating her characters and that she therefore considers it very important for her to understand her own story, her own reality as a way to uh, be effective in the fictional world. Is that something that you would describe as part of your tool set as well? Yeah, I, I let uh, <clears throat> I may have said this before with you, but I give the characters free will and I let them become who they need to become to carry this story uh, that will be different from other stories. Uh, but at the same time, uh, things you're coming to terms with about life and the world, uh, you see moments where that character may be different from you in other ways. Uh, suddenly you realize shares this new moment of satori or whatever that you've just gone through and uh, and that is interesting too i think that happens starts to happen on the subconscious level something you've been dwelling on thinking about trying to understand about the world and life and how things hang together uh, is suddenly your subconscious says oh this this is something that is in this character and pretty soon you're writing about it as a way to explore it yourself uh, because I don't sit around all day dwelling on it with a hand under my fist like the thinker. Uh, <laughs> but when I'm writing from the point of view of a, another character, I can sometimes pry into something almost better than, than if I'm doing it from my own perspective. Uh, it's like getting another point of view mm-hmm. on the issue. It sounds strange, certainly the way it works. Yeah, it's kind of a bank shot into the yeah, topic. I'll, I'll, like that. I'll use that. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to see my agent first. <laughs> uh, You'll have to sue me. That's... <laughs> oh, yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, tomorrow, uh, The Big Dark Sky will be released by Thomas and Mercer. Uh, I think you've written more than 100 books, around 100 books. Over that time, do you develop any kind of a ritual or expectations about what it's like on publication date and anything you know is going to be different about the release of this book compared with uh, kind of most of your other books? It's, uh, it, you know, I've, I've been around so long, I don't think much about, oh, it's pub day. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I'm always thinking about what I'm working on now. And, and I have had such pleasure at Thomas Mer- Mercer working with everybody there. And I don't just say that to say it. It's been very inspiring, uh, the group of people I'm working with. And as a consequence, I've I've never been so far ahead of schedule. I have two completed books in-house after The Big Dark Sky, and I'm about halfway through another one. Uh, and they have been some of the most fun projects I've worked on. There's a book coming in January called The House at the End of the World that uh, has been will be followed by one called After Death. And I thought at my age I'd be running out of ideas. But when you get, when you're involved with people who are enthusiastic, who get excited about their own part in all of this, it inspires you. It gets your brain working uh, again because I have to say a lot of New York publishing had gotten kind of tedious. Uh, And there wasn't that, it's kind of an older crowd in all the higher positions in New York. You get into uh, the Amazon world, and there's a lot more youth bubbling up. And maybe at my age, I need that, because uh, it certainly has inspired me, gives me some of the better ideas I've had that are now sitting there waiting to be published. So I'm always thinking about the new one rather than the one that's just about to come out. Well, I, I, I remembered that two years ago when the five-book contract with, with Amazon Publishing was announced, you were quoted as uh, saying that it was exciting based on the presentations from the various publishers you looked at that the uh comfort level with change at Amazon Publishing made you think it would be great to be with a publisher who not only understands change, but embraces it. And I wonder if in the last two years, consequential years, given the pandemic and all, have you had that intuition about 
the team you were going to be joining on with uh, staying ahead of the change or embracing change in these turbulent two years in a way that made you realize you really had made the right choice to uh, go with a younger change oriented crowd? I I think it has. Yes. Uh, I signed the second five book contract, which uh, uh, begins with uh, the house at the end of the world next January. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's odd when you're working with Thomas and Mercer and the Amazon company, uh, the, 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 the legacy book business, let us call it that. Uh, your sales don't get accounted for the bestseller list. So even though you're selling well, you're not going to be there. I knew that coming into it. I, I saw all the kind of envy, jealousy, con- competition that goes on in publishing, which I think is sad. Uh, but I thought what's more important is reaching people and, and do it in, in a in a way that uh, uh, broadens the audience if we can, because you don't want to spend your whole life talking to the same group of people, or at least I don't. You, want, you don't want to lose those people, but you want to go out and expand who you haven't maybe reached before. And I think we've been doing some of that. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, also uh, when I deliver a book, I get good at it going off feedback, but I don't get what I often got out of New York, which was, you can't cross this genre with that one. You can't do this with that. Uh, that just doesn't come up. Or, or I don't get that other thing is that, oh, you can't say this or you can't say that. You know, a sort of crunching it in. I, yeah, I used to, or I still do say that, young know, writers, when you deal out of, when in an, almost an entire industry is in one city, which publishing is in New York, uh, you get this common wisdom that evolves because everybody in the business knows everybody else and they all work in the same fashion. But a lot of common wisdom is common, but it isn't wisdom. And as a consequence, when you get away from it, where it's a different group thinking about it a different way, it can be quite exciting. Yeah, it reminds me of something. I, I, I've been reading a book called How to Build a Second Brain uh, by a guy named Forte. He's using a lot of technology to, you know, remember things in an organized way for the purpose of writing things. Great book. But his father was from the Philippines, grew up in the U.S. in Southern California, married a Brazilian singer. And when the family moved to Brazil, the father was intent on them learning to speak Portuguese, maintaining their uh, other culture, at that point, three cultures, American, Filipino, and and, uh, Brazilian. And the son, in a documentary, he said, Dad, why did you insist that we do that? And he said, well, first, I wanted you to get along with your grandparents, and they only spoke Portuguese. But the the other thing is, I wanted you to have a multicultural uh, sense of the world, because if you can see things from more than one point of view, you're safer and you're more difficult to deceive. And I thought that was kind of brilliant, you know, that you're you're actually it. It sometimes can be difficult to be straddling cultures, but you are gaining in safety and making yourself more difficult to deceive because of it. Uh, this is this this plays into one of my frustrations uh, that I was having uh, before this new turn in my career. And this is a big country in terms of territory, and it has many different cultures in it. Uh, the Midwest is a totally different world from East Coast or West Coast, and there's different places all over this country. But out of mainstream publishing largely publishes for a narrow sliver of this country and they are not aware of that uh, and uh, I, I thought i thought it was so limiting I, I i have friends who have a famous bookstore in kansas and they were just out here and we saw them for dinner uh, and they were talking about the same thing that they they will say to to somebody from new york who's saying this is going to be a huge book and this is a very successful store where they can sell 
a thousand copies of the book that they do an author signing, sometimes even more. And uh, uh, they said, the thing is, you'll, they'll, come, they'll come to you and they'll send it to you because you sell, they sell some of my book. I say, this is going to be the biggest book of the year. And they'll read it and say, not in the Midwest. <laughs> because of this, this, and this. The F yeah. word is in this book 240 times. If it's in the book more than three, our customers will bring the book back to this yeah. and say, this is unnecessary. <laughs> and they said, that, that's just one example. But they said, every time they say that, they don't get any any consideration. The, mm. the sales rep, the, the publisher who's talking to them, will say, well, no, you're wrong about that. And so <laughs> we've been doing this all our lives. Yeah. All our customers. And, and so I think there's a high value nature to mainstream publishing that I don't know how you break it. That, that story about that man making sure his children had all those cultures, that's what's lacking in, a, in an industry that is in a bubble. And it publishes largely for other people in that bubble. And w- when they break out and do something they don't understand, it oftentimes is more successful than they ever expected. A perfect example of that was Tom Clancy. Uh, there was no such genre as Tom Clancy uh, when he published Hunt for Red October. But that book was turned down by everybody in general publishing. It had to be published by the Naval Institute Press. And when it, it became this enormous success, then New York Publishing went and published that. And then they were publishing hundreds of titles a year that were in the Tom Clancy thing. And so they pretty much, I think, overwhelmed the audience with material. But in, until somebody else shows it, it often time, it has to come out of somewhere else and be a success. And that got very frustrating for me over the years. We had a lot of success, but it happened because we had a readers that it was word of mouth. It was very rarely with any support. Uh, and when the word of mouth would make it grow, then the publisher would come along with it to some extent, but was never out in front with it. Uh, and when I saw how uh, it would be at an Amazon uh, company, I like Thomas and Mercer, that was a whole different ballgame. Interesting. Uh, one of the things that you realized you were giving up uh, had to do with the the boycott by Barnes and Noble and a lot of independent bookstores. And I read something, I I think there's a Wall Street Journal article about the time that you announced the contract with Amazon and uh, Jeffrey Trachtenberg had said, maybe James Dount, the new CEO of Barnes and Noble, was going to loosen that because he made some comment about, well, does it really make sense to boycott a, you know, a, a very popular author just because of the, the corporate connection? Uh, I haven't been in a Barnes and Noble lately, but do you think there's Dount has caused any loosening of that uh, sort of small approach they were taking two years ago? If they have, yeah, it's not chain wide. Uh, it's possible. I think, I think one thing he wanted to do was give individual shop managers more leeway on what they could order and display, which I thought was wise. Uh, uh, and in that sense, maybe there's some who do that. Uh, we have independent stores that are supportive of what I do and then uh, others that aren't. It's, I just saw that, uh, Things were changing, and there was a. And if publishers didn't change with the times, it was going to be very damaging to writers. And I have to say, if you look at what's happened to mainstream publishing, which consciously killed the mass market paperback, uh, where careers were built for most of my lifetime, uh, but the price point was thought to be not high enough, and they thought they could move everybody into the $16 trade paperback, which they couldn't. Uh, ebooks took up some of the slack, but not enough. Uh, and when I was hitting that top of the bestseller, it could take anywhere from a minimum of 50 to 70,000 copies in, in the first week to get to that number one spot. Now I see books there with 19,000 hardcovers. That means they're selling books, but it's not like it used to be. And a lot of that is shooting yourself in the foot. And, um, 
and I, I love the years I was in that publishing, uh, except for that very thing, that resistance to doing things in a different way. And eventually that catches up with them in any business. Uh, it may be a simplistic analogy, but I have been just, you know, I'm over it more than I was when I started this podcast. But but the artificially inflated ebook prices that they've insisted, you know, a, a fifteen dollar charge for a book that has absolutely zero variable cost to print another copy, and and the fairly evident, I think, conscious desire to to suppress that way of reading in order to maintain some kind of corporate strategy vis-a-vis -vis Amazon. But is there any kind of a parallel between the paperback story you referred to and what they've been doing with eBooks? Uh, I think, yeah, that's the same kind of thinking. Uh, but, uh, you know, a paper, mass market paperback published in volume, which when, when we were, when I was at Putnam or even later, at other houses, um, you'd have a new book in hardcover, and when the paperback came out, you could sell two million paperbacks in the first year, uh, and then go on and on. Uh, as new paperbacks came, they fed to the desire of new readers for the old one. To give that up was not just giving up. Uh, first of all, when you're at my point, when you're publishing that volume in those days, the pa paperback cost was like 28, 30 cents unit, you're selling it at $8 to $10. <laughs> yes, you're giving a discount to the store and the author is ending up with a buck or a buck 50 from that paperback. But you still got quite a bit of profit in that. And to give that up and, and give up with it the training ground for writers, but also the, where writers were discovered, a uh, much greater number of people would pay that $8 or 10 to try a new writer, then we'll pay 15 or $16. So you were giving up very much. Then there's also, when those paperbacks were everywhere, supermarkets, drugstores, and when they were all there with the face out of the covers, those were all little mini posters. And they were, they were impulse uh, buying advertisement. You'd see a cover that appealed to you, yeah, I got to try that. Uh, well, it isn't the same as seeing that little image on the computer screen. And it, when the, the books aren't in supermarkets and all those other places, you're no longer as integral to the culture as you were. And there's all kinds of things that got lost in the effort to raise the price point. And with uh, e-books, uh, I think it's, I think it's an attempt, all right, all right, we sort of shot ourselves in the foot with the paperback. So we're going to make up for it by charging fifteen dollars. <laughs> other and it's it's more of the same thinking, uh, and it's it's it doesn't work. No, <laughs> so. that's yeah. I hate that phrase, doubling down on something, but I can't think of a better example of it. Um, I think you had a birthday nine days ago, right? Seventy-seven. Seventy-seven. Yeah. And. Uh, I have here, I was going to ask about retirement, but you answered that by saying you signed on to write another five books, and uh, uh, I'm going to be 72 in August, and I I think about, I heard a term, I think it came out of a, you know, some spiritual writer, and it was the grace of diminution, and it was, I think, trying to put a, a, a happy face on the kinds of things that happen in your 70s and 80s if you're lucky uh and i and i felt some of it i mean some of the things i've let go of that i used to think i have to do this I, you know the podcast i went from weekly now it's monthly or whenever i have somebody i want to talk to uh there really is a kind of a lightness and you know i've got grandkids staying with me and if i if i drop some of the load that i have carried all my professional career I think the fear is I'm going to, you know, die eating bonbons on a chaise in Florida or something, but it doesn't seem to work that way. Other really good things fill in. But are you in the midst of your continued pace of writing? Are you making any kind of adjustments in how you think of yourself 
becoming old or older? Or how, how are you making your peace with the the road that you're five years uh, ahead of me to where we're both going? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, way that's too a somber turn there. <laughs> but uh, no, I understand what you mean about what. There's all kinds of things I used to be concerned about that I don't even think about anymore. Hmm. Uh, there, uh, there, I used to have relationships that were not terribly satisfying, you know, like friendships and stuff that you, 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 you maintain for years, but often you were the one maintaining them more than the other, you know, that sort of thing. And there were moments that arose and I just let some of that go away because it wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling. Uh, hmm. And you begin to think, okay, that was all fine when I was 30 and 40. Uh, and you had time for other things. But now it's more important that the people that I like the most are the ones I have time with and, uh, and that I have the most in common with. And you just let things go away. You, that you don't have to make the conscious effort to say, get out of my life. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to fire anybody. They no, they just yes. sort of drift off and you realize how much work you put into keeping them close. <laughs> yeah. And that that is a kind of free thing. And it happens also with just small stuff uh, that you used to think, oh, I got to do that. I've got to follow that. You know, I used to get, I, this is no exaggeration. I probably got subscribed to as many as 50 or 60 magazines years Ooh. ago. Right now, I think I'm down to well three, mm -hmm. and uh, and I don't even pay that much attention to those. Uh, I read the Wall Street Journal. I get uh, other things that come in, uh, and I, I used to think, oh, I don't want to miss that article or that one. Now I realize, you know, it. My life is is in some ways much better that I think I don't have to be okay with all this <laughs> stuff. Uh, yeah. And it was now I realize a lot of the stuff that wasn't really adding anything much to my life, uh, uh, except higher levels of trivia. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the magazines had good things in them, you know. But there were also you look back on it, think what did a lot of that that I was bothering to keep current with do to my life, or what would it, I've done better with that time? So, but the one thing I stay with me as uh, the writing because I'm intrigued that I keep getting ideas that some of them are as good as any idea I ever had. And the English language gets more and more interesting and malleable uh, as I go. And I think of new ways of approaching a story. I've got one now that I'm working on that I would have never attempted this structure until now. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see the response to it. Because I take the, the character in a, and put her, she's in an interesting position, but her, and she's an extremely interesting character to me, uh, and I think will be to readers. But instead of starting the story like as I once would have with this intrusive person that enters their life, I sort of, the whole first almost half of the book is this character at different points in her life, and I keep cutting between them. And it became the most interesting way to approach this character, this suspenseful story about this bad person has entered her life. is only one interesting story in her life, and you need to know how she got here through those other things. And instead of doing that linear storytelling, I found this way to be cutting between various points in her past and the current that I've never actually seen before and I've read thousands of novels. And the thing I worried about was, will the reader be confused? And how do I you know where she is at the time? And I found that it was a struggle at first, but I think now it's as easy to read it as I've written. And, and to come up with something that I hadn't done before and hadn't seen done, and then trying to pull it off and then thinking, I think this is working, is very rewarding. And I, I wouldn't, I would be no good lying by the pool with an umbrella drink. I just, <laughs> I, I would probably go bad. Uh, and it's, it's, there's something about 
continuing to create it keeps you functioning and alert to the world, I think. And I'm not going to give that up until God tells me it's time to either fall dead into the keyboard or to find a different career because you're losing it. So. Yeah, yeah. How about your, you mentioned the cutting back on uh, magazines, periodicals. Is your, uh, the amount of time you're spending reading books changed and the way you're reading books or choosing books to read? What, what's, how does that look at in this phase of your career in life? When I walked through the library, in the current house, we had uh, an indoor pool, and we took the indoor pool out uh, and turned that very large space into a large library. And when I walk through it and I look at books that I've had for 50 years uh, on the shelves, and I go, why didn't I get rid of that? Uh, and I did get rid of the number uh, when we moved. But but, uh, but then I... I Notice that, yeah, my tastes change. And sometimes I force myself to go back and read something I loved. And if it's the right author, I still love it. Uh, but then other things I go back, why did I think this? I try to start reading it, and I can't. So, yeah, you evolve and change. But certain people like John D. McDonald, uh, Michael Ray Bradbury, uh, that doesn't change. That is a quality that you maintain a fascination with for a lot of years i i had to smile because there was a uh, a reference to jane hawk in this book where the i think uh uh joanna's uh, mother uh is a big reader of jane hawk and somebody says well, who do you, who are you jane hawk you're sort of a superwoman in this scene and who's jane hawk well she's this great writer that my mother really likes and and uh, I thought that was nice to be able to bring in uh, someone from, you know, that really successful and popular series into this book. And uh, uh, that was enjoyable. It's one of those things you think, should I do this? And it's a little fun just to sneak that in. And uh, as as younger readers will say, oh, it was a cool like, Easter egg. Yeah, yeah. I like finding Easter eggs. In <laughs> That's good. Uh and uh, I think I saw uh, Elsa go by uh, sure. as, as she learned, uh, and we've talked about language. Uh, is she still learning new words two years? Uh, I think we talked two years ago, and uh, that, that whole idea that a dog is not only learning new words, but is sort of growing in intelligence and uh, enriching the relationship with the things they can teach. What what has she learned lately that's delighted you? Well, she uh, she now knows the word cantaloupe, <laughs> and it's it's a misnomer because it's actually something I think it's called a sugar melon or something not uh-huh. like a cantaloupe, but they're they're much better, and uh, she's been getting those at night. Uh, she gets a, a couple of slices chopped up and oh. as a bedtime treat. And uh, this has been going on for only a few weeks. And uh, last night I said, is there, is there fresh cantaloupe? And Elsa was laying in the corner of the room, jumped up and came running. <laughs> <laughs> and a few months ago, uh, she uh, I realized she learned the word upstairs. She heard us use it. We were someplace, and I said, uh, oh, I left that upstairs. She jumped up and ran to the steps and went up. And this wasn't in your house? It was a place you were visiting? No, it was in our house. Oh, in your house, yeah. But it was the word upstairs. Right. She reacted and thought, oh, we're going to bed. How about that? uh, We weren't ready for bed yet. So they pick up stuff, and if you're not alert, you kind of miss it. But we're so dog-oriented that we notice these things. Yeah. it's it's kind of fascinating. For sure. Uh, well, anything else about this book or uh, other news you want to mention uh, in, in wrapping up? Well, um, I just hope people will enjoy the book. Uh, it was tricky to write. That is a kind of large cast. And, and uh, we just got a review from England, I like. But the thing they liked about it was it wasn't just premise you know what it is at the beginning characters you know where they're going at the beginning but it was it's mysterious and involving and that was the intention uh, and uh, so i hope people will like it 
Uh, I've done books like that before uh, where uh, you have no idea where how all these characters are coming together. And they've always been popular when I've done them before. So I hope people like this. I, I had fun with it. And, uh, and it had that, uh, the book list review, which was very yeah. sad uh, about them. There's two really bad villains in this book. But I like that it said the uh, main villain is absolutely wackadoodle, but totally compelling. I thought, yep, this is how it is wackadoodle. But, uh, <laughs> Well, and I like the Kirkus uh, review blurb, a nonstop actioner with cosmic overtones. I say, well, that that sounds like my guy, Dean. <laughs> uh, that's good. Well, let's see. That's everything. And I have been speaking with Dean Kuntz, author of The Big Dark Sky, a novel released this week by Thomas and Mercer, an imprint of Amazon Publishing. Thanks very much, Dean. Great to talk with you. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Take care. Get back to the Grinch. I will. I will. Job one. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. I love listening to interviews after I've recorded them and, you know, doing a little tightening up here and there because when I'm actually having conversations, sometimes I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to ask next? I'm always trying to listen very carefully, but when I listen to it again, I get uh, an even fuller experience of uh, talking to someone like Dean Koontz. And I guess the thing that left me inspired about talking with Dean this time, and it's a theme that has run through our past couple of conversations, is the idea of creativity as something that he is uh, totally engaged in, even as he is, uh, you know, letting go of some things uh, in his 70s that made sense to keep on track of in his 30s and 40s. And uh, I wrote down a quote. He said, there's something about continuing to create that keeps you functioning and alert to the world. Uh, that makes total sense to me, that, that the act of creating is probably at any age, but I know at my age, as I approach 72 next month, uh, it unleashes things and it does keep me functioning. And it makes me alert to the world. Uh, I've talked about this book, uh, How to Create a Second Brain, by uh, Tiago Forte. And the whole gist of that book is using a program like Notes to, in an organized way, capture thoughts that might lead to creative projects and then setting up those projects in a, a purposeful way. So I feel like my own creativity has been turbocharged by the experience of reading this book, which I read twice, and it leaves me uh, leaning into my creative projects, like this podcast, like the two videos I put up uh, about Astro, the home robot, and I, I can feel the difference. It, it, it's just remarkable. The other thing I love is for somebody like Dean, who's been at his career for you know forty plus years, to share how in this particular book. It stems from an idea that first occurred to him uh, 40 years ago, uh, the idea of synchronicity and uh, what he had read in Jung and uh, playing with it, wondering how he might turn it into a novel. And then 40 years later comes the idea of these characters and this very complex uh, story, which is action packed and it has all kinds of overtones of uh, what's real, what's right, uh, how does humanity make its way through uh, any kind of a, a threat. So th that's a benefit of uh, wisdom in old age for a writer. Uh, and he, I, I, I think as I thought about talking to him this time, when I first talked to him, I think it, it came when he had switched to Amazon Publishing, and there was uh, quite a bit of coverage about it. It was a big deal for someone who is as uh, successful an author as Dean Koontz to switch from one of the big five publishers to Amazon. And he was very uh, complimentary. He loved how young the team was, how energetic they were. And I thought, well, okay, it kind of sounds like a honeymoon. And uh, I wonder if two years into it, five books into it, uh, has it gotten a little old hat? Is he any less enthusiastic about this experience than he was when it first got going? 
I think the answer is pretty clearly no. He's he's still completely uh, inspired by the people he's working on at Amazon. I love it when he said, people who are excited get your brain working again. And they've helped him to just create new things. Uh, one of the most exciting things, things I thought he shared with us in that interview was uh, he's working on a book now in which he's uh, experimenting with an entirely new way to tell a story. And this is a man who's published a hundred books and numerous stories. And uh, at 77, he's playing with the form and coming up with a, it sounds like a, a quite radical departure from a chronological storytelling to tell this next story, which is going to be one of the next five books that he's writing for Amazon Publishing. Uh, great to talk to him, and it left me uh, pretty charged up about the creative life and the joy of books and uh, having a chance to talk to someone more than once about their work and their writing. And I look forward to staying in touch with him. He's, he, he, he's going to be hard to keep up with uh, uh, five books in two years. I don't know if his current contract is going to keep him at that pace. But uh, for sure, any chance I have a chance to talk to him about his latest creation, I'll be sharing that with you. Uh, in uh, a couple of tech uh, updates, the, the Amazon Astro Home Robot has been a big hit here with my two youngest grandsons, Ryan and Jake, who are six and eight. And they're, they've been here for four days now in what we call Grandpa and D camp because they call Darlene D. And they, they just, they're talking to him as if he's uh, like a, a, another sibling. And they bring him out into the kitchen and they dance with him and they have him... Uh, you know, make fart noises and and the genius of the design of this teeny little robot is all the suggestions that it has of kind of human characteristics like the eyes are very expressive the big round eyes on the screen and they'll blink and they'll raise and make different gestures and the eyes are, are I guess you just get a lot of information about any kind of a creature from its eyes uh, and Astro's eyes are quite compelling uh, there's lots more to, to learn about it, and uh, I'm looking forward to each step of the way as that goes on. Darlene got a new Kindle Oasis. We got a good deal on... Oh, it reminds me, I've got to send in the trade-in of her old Oasis, which has finally given up the ghost. And when it arrived, she said, gee, it's so thin. I think I'm going to like this. She had been resistant because she thought it was the screen was too big. But we finally got it uh, hooked up for her today, and I, I hope she's really going to enjoy reading on it and that it'll last for a good long time. That's it for the Kindle Chronicles from Ocean Park, Maine. I really appreciate the time you've taken to listen to my podcast. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>